and welcome to part two of the Mitigating Stress webinar. My name is Michael Majekas. Once again, I'm an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Professions and Kinesiology at Hofstra University and an adjunct professor in the Department of Health, Physiology, Education and Movement Science at Long Island University Post Branch Campus. I'm also a personal trainer, assistant women's swimming coach at LAU Post and one of the training of Eagle wellness experts. In review of the Understanding Stress webinar and the first part of the Mitigating Stress webinar, a stress is a nonspecific response to the body or a physical reaction to a situation. An individual may experience use stress, which results in positive effects, better relationships, uh, improved performance, attention, memory, motivation, creativity, as well as productivity. Or an individual may experience distress, which results in negative effects, such as decreased productivity, anxiety, decreased performance, potentially negatively affecting blood pressure, decreasing immunity, and increasing the likelihood of chronic illness. We also discussed that stress is necessary to improve the ability to grow and develop in the face of adversity, this resiliency. Stress is necessary to improve creativity, attention, and memory, and performance. But too much stress may result in burnout, leading to poor, perform poor performance as well as health and wellness. It's also been beneficial to identify the stressors and the effects that the stressors have on the body. This is commonly referred to as self-awareness, which is the recognition of the effects of the stress. Now, this recognition can help with the self-regulation, which is the management of the stress. And we covered and reinforced that stressors can result from the environment. Stressors can re uh, result from your social circle, your friends and your family or your coworkers. And stress can be emotional as well as physical. We also discuss ways to mitigate stress to improve productivity, motivation, and performance, including the diaphragmatic breath, improving the quality of sleep, as well as exercise. Now, the objectives in this section of the Mitigating Stress webinar, I will provide specific actionable steps to reduce stress by improving breathing, improving the quality of sleep, reducing workplace stress, as well as starting or continuing an exercise protocol. I also wanted to, re to reiterate that there is a supplemental handout that can assist with the webinar displaying a trigger identification and the stress reduction techniques. Now, the first strategy that I'll introduce and expand on is the diaphragmatic breath. Now, in order to prepare for an effective and an efficient breath, the important thing is you want to find and assume a comfortable position. Now, some individuals prefer sitting on a chair in a nice, tall, upright position. Some prefer sitting on the floor in the lotus position, which is a, a cross-legged seated position. And some prefer lying down on the floor. The key thing is that you want to assume a comfortable position, which means free from pain as well as free from discomfort. And you'll see these, these pictures depicting the seated position, the seated position on the floor, uh, as well as a lying position. Now, this slide depicts a specific breathing sequence. Now, these sequences, as we'll explore in the next webinar, can be something referred to as the four, seven, eight breath, which is a four second inhalation, a seven second pause, and an eight second exhalation. The breath can be a rectangular breath where you have a four second inhalation, a two second pause, a four second exhalation, and a two second pause. Or it could be just a conscious awareness to the breath, just slowing down the breath and reinforcing the depth of the breath and just relaxing. But before we begin, let's let's reaffirm let's reaffirm that you found a comfortable position. A, a quiet location may help as well. So in order to confirm that it's a diaphragmatic breath, before we do the sequence, you may place one hand on your abdomen and one hand on your chest. You want to inhale slowly and deeply through your nose into your abdomen. And you want to breathe only as deeply as what feels comfortable. And what you should notice is that your chest should remain relatively still. And you should feel your, your abdomen rising and falling. On the inhalation, it, you'll feel that the belly will distend or it will come out. And on the in or exhalation, you'll feel that the abdomen will come in. And when you feel comfortable with this, with this technique, you can now start looking at a sequence. So we can count to four on the inhale. So as we're going through, we're inhaling and exhaling through our nose. So we can start inhaling, two, three, four, pause, two, three, 
two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Pause, two, three, four. And one more time. Inhale, three, four. Pause, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Pause, two, three, four. The key is that you want to focus attention on the breath and try to tune out any other thoughts or any other sounds. And you can repeat these steps until you count, let's say, several square breaths. You can do it for one minute. You can do it for two minutes. But if you're having difficulty with the counting, the key is to, to just, just to relax. Please don't make the counting as the stressor. Similar to what I talked about in the, in the first webinar, uh, being, or doing a webinar on stress is an inherent stressor. So we don't want to make a protocol to reduce stress as being the stressor. So again, if you're having difficulty with the counting, the key thing is to just relax. Don't make that counting the stressor. And this is just an exercise to slow down the breath, making it a deeper breath by breathing through the nose and letting your abdomen as opposed to your chest move. And in time, you'll feel comfortable diaphragmatically or diaphragmatic breathing in everyday settings. At work, instead of grabbing a soda or a cup of coffee during your lunch break, as you take the bus or the train to work, during a commercial break when you're watching TV, after you work out or your evening, evening walk, before bed to help you fall asleep, uh, in the morning after you wake, or anytime you feel a stressor coming on. And I referenced this a few times in a previous webinar, but when I felt an episode coming on, I relaxed by controlling my breathing, and it, and it worked very, very well. Okay, let's revisit the workplace. Most individuals spend 15 to 60 plus hours a week at work. So whether it is responding to emails, working on a project, or discussing workplace strategies with a colleague, it's important to find ways to help mitigate stress. Now, as previously mentioned, trigger identification is a critical aspect of reducing stress. Therefore, it is important to have this self-awareness so that you can identify and recognize your emotions towards a situation so then you can develop self-management, this ability to regulate those emotions. We can look at this by setting goals. So for example, imagine that you have a full plate of work projects that you have to do. You recognize that you feel overwhelmed and the negative effects that may result. A way to manage that stress is to prioritize what has to be completed first, or see if you can delegate some of the other tasks to a coworker. You can also change the way you think about a situation. For example, you can observe all the work you have for the week and feel very overwhelmed and stressed. The problem is that this will ultimately decrease your ability to perform your tasks optimally. But if you reframe the amount of work you have to a more positive spin, you may decrease your stress. So instead of letting the work decrease your performance, imagine all the things that you can do once you complete the work. So for example, your schedule may free up a bit so you'll enjoy the weekend so much more once the work is complete. And then finally, it's important to prioritize and pace yourself and understand that certain tasks may take longer than others. Another way to look at this is to accept what cannot be changed and remove any unnecessary distractions. For example, it may be challenging to change the 8 to 4 schedule. Uh, if you find yourself constantly checking emails that, that hinder your ability to get work done, choose to check emails once every few hours as opposed to constantly. Time management is also very important. Prioritize your daily and weekly schedule as it always helps to think and it always helps to think positively. And as we observed earlier in the webinar and what I'll explore next, exercise can also help with productivity as well as performance. Here we have a 15 minute recovery exercise. So start by visualizing and strategizing what you have to complete and how it will be completed. This is referred to as future self visualization. One of the reasons why individuals don't save money for retirement is because they don't see their future self. But if they picture themselves for a project that needed to be completed in the future, they're much more likely to adhere to the behaviors necessary to complete that. Essentially, a fail to plan is a plan to fail. 
So once you visualize it, just like an engineer will lay out the blueprint prior to doing any work on the project. So once we have this, this visualization, step away for 10 minutes, take a walk, get some fresh air. Moving always helps with memory, attention, and focus. So we visualize, we step away for a few minutes, and then we return. Try maybe diaphragmatically breathing for a few minutes and then resume your task. This is, so this is one example of a 15 minute recovery exercise that may help with overall productivity. Now we know that many behaviors or exercise can reduce stress, but one such behavior that some individuals take for granted is sleep. Getting adequate sleep makes you more able to tackle the day's stresses more easily. When you're tired, you are less patient, more easily agitated, which can increase your stress and lead to this kind of this vicious cycle, as we mentioned in the, in the previous uh, webinar, this distress cycle. Now, most adults need seven to nine hours of quality of sleep per night, and practicing good sleep hygiene along with stress lowering tactics can, can help improve that quality of sleep. So what does it mean to have good sleep hygiene? It refers to a set of beneficial behaviors or steps that you can undertake to improve the quality of your sleep. And these include maintaining a regular sleep wake schedule. Our body responds very, very well to a schedule. This is why shift workers may have issues with sleep or why it takes a few days to readjust after you return from vacation when there's a time difference, especially if you're traveling for extended periods of time. Another tip would be avoiding naps or stimulants during the day. So if we rest too much during the day, sometimes that may affect sleep later on at night. And stimulants during the day, especially after 2 or 3 p.m., including coffee as well as tea, may affect it. So keep any prolonged rest less than an hour. And again, avoid any caffeine sparingly after 2 or after 3 p.m. And establish a regular relaxing routine that you practice before bed. You can uh, take a warm bath or read a book. I know my wife and I, we choose one day a week where we read a book instead of, instead of watching TV. And that just helps the overall relaxation process and just getting one night of that quality sleep. Now, some additional things to consider. Let's take a look at light. And we know that the, the purpose of the eye is to determine the intensity of the ambient light. So the brighter the room, the eyes would communicate with the body to stay awake. Therefore, you want the room as dark as you possibly can. You can use things like blackout shades or anything to keep that room dark. So light is very, very important thing to consider. Sound may also be an issue, whether it's traffic, TV, or music. Uh, one thing that we use at night is white noise. We have an app that uh, has ocean waves and has or has rainfall. So these sound machines that include the, the soothing rain, the, the ocean waves can be very, very beneficial. Temperature also plays a role. We know that optimal temperature is on the cooler end. Some suggest between 60 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So you want to adjust the temperature to what feels optimal for you but too warm or too cold will affect your quality of sleep. Touch is also a consideration. So situating um, a sleep schedule with, you, with your partner, uh, pets, if a pet's in the room, uh, or pillows. So you want to adjust to what feels the most comfortable. So here's a, a summary of sleep do's and don'ts. So if we're going to consume a meal, maybe you want to have a lighter meal later on, or if you're going to consume a heavier meal, eat dinner a little bit earlier. Maybe exercise earlier, especially if the intensity is high. You know, taking a walk after dinner before you, you know, an hour or two hours before you go to bed, if it's light intensity, may not be an issue. But the more intense the exercise, the more that may interfere with the exercise, the more that may interfere with, with your sleep. So you want to breathe diaphragmatically. You want to relax the breath through the nose. Uh, you want to be comfortable and, and be consistent. Try to avoid things like nicotine and alcohol, as well as caffeine. Now, as previously mentioned, one of the best ways to manage stress is by exercising. 
exercises or exercise releases beneficial chemicals and improve mood, decision making, and ultimately reducing stress. And that Hippocrates saying is worth repeating. Hippocrates was famously quoted as saying, if you're in a bad mood, go for a walk. If you return and you're still in a bad mood, go for a walk. This is wise advice. <clears throat> now, I know that this changes and it's contingent on your goals, but the current recommendations for exercise is about 150 minutes per week, which calculates to about 20 minutes per day. You can also consider four days per week at 30 to 40 minutes. The key is habitual physical activity, meaning that try and do some activity every single day, whether it's walking the dog several times per day, playing with your kids, walking before or after work. You want to consider moving uh, habitually throughout the week. Other considerations include social exercise, such that you're more likely to exercise if you're doing it with a friend or a group of individuals with a common goal. How hard you work out is important. You want to make sure that you're doing more than you're used to, but if you're working out too hard and risking injury, this may be an issue. So the concept that we're referring to when you're exercising with too much intensity for your body's ability to adapt was referred to in the uh, previous sections when we discussed the phases of sleep, uh, the state, the phases of stress. Other considerations include fitting exercise into your time restrictions, whether it's on a lunch break or before or after work. Also, whether you'll be exercising indoors or outdoors and choosing exercises that you enjoy as opposed to exercises that you may not stick with because you dislike. So if you dislike swimming, you're likely to not stick with that if you, you choose that as a modality. Conversely, if you enjoy hiking, you're more likely to stick with it. So choose the modality that is your preference that you enjoy doing. In certain examples of exercise include walking, swimming, biking, weightlifting, yoga. The ultimate key is to stick with an exercise program and to choose a modality that you enjoy. So in review of the webinar, it's beneficial to identify the stressors and the effects that they have on the body. This is commonly referred to as self-awareness, that recognition of the effects of stress. This recognition can lead, with, can lead to self-regulation, which is the management of stress. And we covered and reinforced that stressors can result from the environment. Stressors can result from your social circle, your friends, your family, your coworkers. Stressors can be physical and emotional. We discuss specific ways to mitigate stress to improve work productivity, motivation, performance, including diaphragmatic breath, actionable steps while at the workplace, and improving the quality of sleep as well as exercise. Up next, we will expand on the diaphragmatic breath and its benefits to mitigate stress and to improve overall health and wellness. Because if we take action today and start exercising, improving the quality of our rest and sleep, we will continue to improve our health and wellness and ultimately feel better. And that concludes part two of the Mitigating Stress webinar. Once again, my name is Michael Majekis, and thank you for listening.